my pleasure to introduce to you today Brother Mark Tanner. Uh, I've known him all of his life. <laughs> uh, we are brothers, and I'm really glad that he could be here. But besides the fact that he's my brother, he's also done many things that I think uh, will be helpful to you today as you learn about uh, some of the various entities he's been involved with. But before I do that, there's one other thing. I did say aloha today, but I did say happy Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day to all of you. Um, Mark has been involved with several various companies through his career. Um, he was has spent 30 years in various leadership and strategy ventures, uh, both in and out of the United States. He was the youngest executive working for United Technologies Corporation. I believe that was almost 10 years with companies such as oh, part of what United Technology uh, owns, Pratt and Whitney. So if you flew here on a plane, it probably has an engine that was created by Pratt and Whitney. Uh, Otis Elevators. So if you've ridden up an escalator and elevator, probably that's also owned by United Technologies. So he was involved with their mergers and acquisition and was their youngest executive. Uh, when he was doing that for them. He's also worked with PepsiCo, uh, was a vice CFO uh, for the PepsiCo International. He worked with them for many years as well. Um, some mergers and acquisitions, I believe, with that job. And also with Pizza Hut, um, with both of those companies in their as CFO positions. He also, for those of you that uh, have ever been involved in watching the Olympics. He was the CFO of the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City uh, for a good bit of time, although he wasn't there to all of the end. He actually had a little accident uh, where he had, a, just after leaving that, where he was with Mrs. Fields Cookies. Uh, but he's currently, right now, the COO of AVID, which is Advancement by Individual Determination. AVID is a nonprofit organization that's in 48 states and 15 countries. Yesterday, he was with the governor of Hawaii as they were talking about some of the educational uh, aspects that AVID helps students throughout the world with. So they'll be having a conference uh, here later this summer, and so he was held here on a pre-trip, plus I had prearranged for him to come speak here today. So we're really excited to hear from him today, both in some of his business experiences and in his social entrepreneurial work with Abbott. And please join me in welcoming Mark Tan. Okay. Well, well, thank you. I greet you in the spirit of aloha. Um, I appreciate Richard's introduction. Yes, he is the older, and I'm the younger, better looking brother uh, in the in the pair. We, he, he and I actually we have uh, we're from a gigantic family so uh, we have 12 siblings there's 13 of us it's hard to believe I met somebody earlier he said oh, I keep meeting Richard's brothers and sisters I said, well you got a long ways to go if you've only met three of us but um, I'm going to try to let you benefit a little bit from the experience I've had but I wanted to start out, I'm going to tell a lot of stories today um, I remember I was working with a fellow named Armando Bacalao and I, we had this big argument we were really good friends but we had a big argument and I was young, and I said, well, Armando, what you need to do is you need to figure out where you want to get to, and then you just sort of map out your life. You just say, okay, I'm starting here, and I'm going to get there, and you know, that's how it works. He goes, no, 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 Mark, it doesn't work that way. You have ups and downs, and you, know, you might have a boss who likes you and one who doesn't like you. He says, some of it's just kismet. And I was positive that I was right, that if you just had the determination and you just had the discipline, you could just map this all out. Well, I'm here to tell you about 25 years later, he was right and I was wrong. It's very, very difficult. I would have never guessed when I, I, I went to Stanford and then I went to UCLA uh, for graduate school. I would have never guessed that in that time I would have worked with elevators in Latin America. So I used to travel to Brazil and Argentina and Mexico quite a bit. Uh, worked with uh, jet engines all over the world. Carrier Air Conditioning is another company that United Technologies owns. Did a lot of deals where we were buying and selling companies. And then I was the CFO of a company in Detroit that made uh, steering wheels for cars, uh, Renault and Peugeot in France and Spain, and then Ford, Chrysler, and GM in the United States. And I went from that to pizza. I mean, there's not a really great connection here, is there? Then we were doing pizza, and then soda water with Pepsi, 
and then Mrs. Fields Cookies, and then late, what I've done for the last five years is a nonprofit, which is Avid. So it's been it's been interesting, and I'm going to try to share with you. Um, how do you get from strategy, because what you don't want to do is just have this intellectual strategy that sounds good in a presentation, but nobody really knows what they're supposed to do. So how do you get from strategy to execution? So in the case of Pepsi, we had 60,000 employees in the United States and Canada. And we all, if we had a product launching on the 4th of July, we wanted to make sure that in every supermarket, the end cap had that product of ours. Okay, that's what we wanted right there. And so you, you have to have, make this thing to be strategic, and then you execute, and hopefully you have success. And the thing I want to mention to you is execution kind of trumps the rest. If you have great execution and your strategy is flawed, will you know quickly that it was a bad, it was a bad strategy? You will, right? If, if your execution is exactly what you thought it was supposed to be, and it doesn't work, you say, wow, that was a bad strategy. But if your execution is sort of hit or miss, uh, sometimes we're going to do this way, sometimes we're going to do it another way. You don't know if it's the strategies that's flawed or your execution. So you want to make sure that you have great execution. All right, a compelling strategy should actually enhance and clarify and give you focus. I'm going to try to give you some examples of this. It ought to result in improved processes and outcomes. One of the things I found out when I was at Pepsi is Pepsi made this huge $3, $3 billion bet and they bought back all the bottling operations. And they said, we can run these operations better than families who've had it for generations. Well, what you couldn't do is reinvent the wheel every time something popped up. So when a vending machine would break down, if nobody had a process in place to say, okay, here's when you send somebody out and they twist a couple of knobs and they fix it, and here's when you send somebody out and they have a, a new vending machine on the back of their truck and they swap it out, it's just chaos if you don't have some processes in place. So you want to have processes that work. And I try to help people in different organizations understand that process is your friend. Because if, if you've got the processes right, you won't have all these heroic efforts to make things work. You'll just have things going the way that they ought to go. And then you use your capabilities and your ingenuity and your inspiration to do more exciting things. Okay. You want it to be sustainable. So my hope is when the day I leave Avid that things will go lickety split the way they've been going. That we won't necessarily say, oh my gosh, the leaders left. The whole thing's going to come crashing down. You want it to be sustainable after you've left and you want to deliver success against whatever your mission is. So I've worked for a lot of organizations, the mission was shareholder value, earnings per share, some, you know, making money. And then I work for an organization now, and that's not our goal. In fact, the board of directors told me about a year ago that we're making too much money, and they want us to, to, to make less. This is in spite of the fact that we've held our prices down, actually we do, uh, reduce our prices. But, so you want to make sure that you're successful against whatever your mission is. Let me tell you a little bit about Pizza Hut. So that's my first example, my first story I'm going to tell you. Pizza Hut was started by two brothers who mo whose mother thought they didn't have enough to do. So the Carney brothers lived in Wichita, Kansas. They were going to Wichita State. And their mother said, you guys need something else to keep you busy. And they were originally going to call it Pizza Shack. But they could only fit nine letters. It's a true story. So it became Pizza Hut. Another part of the true story is they were at a Catholic fraterni fraternity. And when they got this thing started, they went to their fraternity brothers and said, hey, I've got this great deal, this great pizza deal. You want to you wanna go out and be my franchisee? Oh, no, no, I'm going to go sell cars for the Ford dealer. But maybe my little brother, he, you know, he needs something to do. Why don't you give it to him? So the little brother, unlike McDonald's, McDonald's gives you a franchise and it's on a certain address. In Pizza Hut, you got the franchise for the whole county. So the little brother went off to Tucson, Arizona. That's Tucson, but they thought it was Tucson. He went off to Tucson, Arizona, and now he lives in Wichita, Kansas and has his private jet and he's flying with the other little brothers and they're, all, they're flying to safaris in Africa and all these other things because they were willing to take a little bit of a, a risk. So that's kind of interesting about them. I also work for Pepsi, Winter Olympics, Mrs. Fields, all, all these things that are bad for you, right? <laughs> sugar, 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 and now I have it. So the Carney Brothers started it. It had a dine-in focus. It's where people would go after a basketball game that pull into Pizza Hut, you know, and a high school basketball game to be sawdust on the floor. And, they had great pizza. It was good. Very much of a Midwestern concept because you can make it work. The real estate didn't cost very much in the Midwest, so you could make it work. Um, but then Steve Reinemann took over and he said, well, we want to make this America's best choice for every pizza occasion. Well, what's a, what's a pizza occasion besides sitting down in a restaurant and dining out? What, what's another pizza occasion? Parties. What? Parties. Parties? And so the pizza needs to come to you, right? 
It's got to be delivered. So delivery is one and also carry out. So we said, okay, we're going to be the best one for every pizza occasion. So we're going to go after carry out and after delivery. Now at the time, carry out was dominated by um, Little Caesars and delivery by Domino's. And there was a big argument within Pizza Hut. The franchisees, the guys that were flying off to their, you know, safaris, uh, they had what was called the fifth vote. I'll, I'll go through this quickly, but in an advertising co-op, that is where the, the commercials are shown, so the state of Hawaii, St. Louis, Missouri, right, Orlando, Florida, two votes went to the company as to what was going to be put on the ads, and two votes went to the franchisees. And then whoever owned more restaurants in that particular area got the fifth vote. Well, the company wanted to push delivery. They wanted to be advertising, we deliver pizza. The franchisees said, no, 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 we don't want to tell people about that. So part of the strategy with Pizza Hut was to buy back enough selected restaurants. That's when I was originally brought in. Buy back enough selected restaurants in these key media areas to get the fifth vote. The first, and sometimes you've got to fail to succeed. The first Pizza Hut was in a meat locker in Scranton, Pennsylvania. We wanted to hide it. We didn't want anyone to know that we delivered pizza. Okay, when I mean, you think about that, it was kind of stupid, wasn't it? And lost a lot of money, and the franchisee said, Nini, nanny, nanny, see, it's a stupid idea. And said, no, we're going to stick with it. And then we figured out a few things. We figured out, for example, that um, you need to understand your market. The delivery market, you want to be targeted to the heavy users. I see some heavy users in this room. Heavy pizza users are males between the ages of 18 and 28. They eat a lot of pizza. So, and, if, and if more shows up, they'll eat even more. And if more shows up, they'll eat more. So you want to be around military bases. You want to be where young families live because it's kind of a treat for the family on payday. You want to drop your coupon three days before payday. So you drop it three days before the Friday of payday, right? So you're usually dropping a coupon on a Wednesday or Monday. And then dad says, well, let's have, some, or mom says, let's have something special on Friday or Saturday night. Let's have pizza delivered to us. Th those are the pizza households. You want to have about an eight mile radius. And don't want, from the time the people pick up the phone to when the pizza shows up on their doorstep, no more than 40 minutes. 45 minutes, they're going to be pretty ticked off. You're not going to get, get a very good tip. If you get it there within, they don't expect it in two minutes, but in about 40 minutes, that's when you got to get there. So all these things that I'm telling you, Domino's knew, knew all that stuff as well. But where Pizza Hut made a difference is we invested a little bit more in a software program. So let's just imagine for right now that all of you are living in a heavy pizza area. That is, you're in a zip code that has lots of young families in it has 18 to 28 year old males in it. It's not, it's not a retirement community, okay? It's, it's not a bunch of yoga instructors. It's a pizza eating community. And so what Pizza Hut would do is they'd say, okay, we've got the zip codes, we've got all the mailing addresses, and as we start getting clients, we'll capture what their mailing address is. And we'll say, my goodness, she and he and he are not ordering pizzas from us. So for the three of you, we'd send you this terrific, terrific offer. You know, it was like a pizza for six bucks or something like that, or four fifty. I can't even remember. And we said, "Gosh, we haven't seen you. We'd like to. We'd like you to be one of our customers. Please try our our pizza." And you say, "Oh, I've been getting it from Domino's, but this is a pretty good deal. You know, six fifty, and they're going to throw in a two liter of Pepsi." So you'd get it, and then on your box would say, "What's your name?" Jennifer. Jennifer. So on your box would say, "Thanks, Jennifer. If you come back within eight days." We're going to give you another good deal. It won't be six fifty and the free Pepsi. It'll be um, six fifty and ninety nine cents for the Pepsi or something like that. We'll do the same for you. Same for you. So what would happen? Just because of that little investment, a little bit more software, we knew that the Domino's owner was usually a retired military person who had put his heart and soul and all his money into his Domino's franchise, and for him, spending the extra twenty thousand dollars on this computer software wasn't worth it. But what would happen in this pizza eating community? is he wouldn't know what was going on, but suddenly he'd see his sales were dropping. And he couldn't figure it out. But we were actually targeting who were probably his clients. And as we picked the three of you, because we knew you were in a pizza eating community, and you weren't buying from us, so we assumed you were buying from him. So that was kind of something that we did that was sort of fun. It's about these coupon drops, and the, the, we started building up the database. And then when, if, if you stopped ordering from us, then we knew we needed to get you another coupon. We needed to get you kind of back into the fold. So that's kind of interesting. And we, the marginal pricing, this was the carryout versus Little Caesars. So the other thing we did is we said, when you locate a, a pizza unit, we found out you didn't want to be in a meat locker. 
You want it to be on the street, and you want it to be on the side of the street where the traffic in the afternoon was going. So as people are heading back to their homes, that's the side of the street you want to be on. You don't want to be on the side of the street where everybody's going past from 7.30 to 9 o'clock in the morning, because they're not buying pizza to take home then. You want to be on the other side of the street. So those are kind of a few things that we did. You know, and we talked about typical Domino's owners. The result was um, Pizza Hut ended up being voted number one by consumers. We supplanted Domino's as the top delivery pizza company, and we supplanted Little Caesars as the top uh, carryout one. So that was kind of a little entrepreneurial stuff within a big corporation, right? It was sort of being nimble on our feet and trying to think through what advantages we could have vis-a-vis -vis the competition. Okay, I'll tell you a little about Pepsi. You're all going to be so hungry by the time I finish this. You're going to want Pizza Hut and Pepsi or whatever. So Pepsi used to be a company that was known primarily for making great commercials. In fact, that even lived. After I, when I was at Pepsi, the Monday after the Super Bowl, the president and the head of manufacturing, the head of advertising, the head of HR would all be sitting in the room and say, oh gosh, you know, we got three of the top commercial spots. We were number one, number four, and number seven. And I would be all happy about that, because that was one of our skills, was making great commercials. But then they decided, okay, we're going to buy back these bottling operations. Bo bottling operations are dirty fingernails kind of work. It's not sitting in, you know, some loft with your Macintosh computer making commercials. So we still wanted to make great commercials, but we started buying back these operationally intensive organizations. We also understood that people were getting older, and as you get older, you think you want more carbonated soda or less? Yes. You want less. So we started thinking through and saying, okay, we'll go after everything that isn't milk or liquor. Any other beverage we're going to go after. So when I was at Pepsi, we decided we'd go after Gatorade. We bought Gatorade. Lipton tea, I know we're a good Mormon university here, but uh, there are some people that drink tea. There was a joint venture with the bottled Lipton tea. And um, then they started to decide to have water that would have properties to it. So water that would either make you smarter or give you more energy. This sounds like passe now, right, in 2013? But back when we got started on this about 12 years ago, that was a whole new idea that you would buy water because there would be some special property to it. We had some flops. So I don't think many of you are old enough to remember. We had this product called Crystal Pepsi. It was Pepsi that was clear. You remember it. You're old. Yeah. Everyone in America tried it. We had great execution. It was on every supermarket shelf the day we launched it. Everyone knew the commercials. Everyone in America tried Crystal Pepsi. Only 17% of the population liked it. But we knew at least that the, we, didn't, we knew it wasn't the execution that was a problem. We knew it was the strategy. People just didn't want to drink clear cola. They wanted their cola to look dark. Um, but instead of firing the guy who had the idea to do that, they actually promoted him, David Novak, made him head of um, KFC, and now David is head of Yum Brands, which is KFC, Taco Bell, uh, Pizza Hut. He's, he's, he's got the whole thing. So they didn't crucify somebody for just making a mistake. They said, okay, we tried, and it didn't work. But the biggest hit, the biggest hit that Pepsi Cola had when I was there was Aquafina. Any of you, most of you know what Aquafina is, right? Prior to Aquafina, people used to think that bottled water had to come from a glacier in France or from Fiji or something. And you had to go to the very source and get that pure, pure water and put it in a bottle and bring it across the, 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 you, you know, the oceans. And then you'd sell it for about $1.29 a, a bottle. Aquafina, you know where it comes from? Does anybody know? It's just your municipal water. However, it is the purest water you will drink because it goes through a process called reverse osmosis. So they take all the gunk out and they put in vitamins and it's, it is really, really good water. But do you think it costs as much as putting it on a barge and bringing it over from France? It costs a lot less. You can make a lot of money taking normal water, going through reverse osmosis, having some advertising behind it, putting a bottle and People love it. That was a big, big success that we had. So that was, that was kind of cool. Uh, we made this huge bet in buying, buying back the bottling system. Um, Pepsi used to, when I was talking about process, they used to take great pride in telling all these horror stories about people who had stayed up till 2 in the morning and then you filled in the blank to do X, Y, or Z. And those, those, those war stories, it really made the person telling them feel kind of good about it. But you know what the flip side to that was? You burn a lot of people out. When that becomes the norm, when individual heroics to get things done become the norm, it's just awful. I mean, we had people that we said, okay, we're going to transfer you. 
and they would talk their wife or their spouse into moving. They'd pull up to the new house with the moving van, and then they'd call and say, oh no, we're transferring you somewhere else. I mean, this, this happened more than once in the history of Pepsi. It just was too much individual heroics. And so we, we said, we've got to adopt some processes that are sustainable and that work. And this Total Beverage Company, th this was the idea that except for alcohol or milk, we were going to sell everything. Because we had the trucks that were already stopping at every Walmart, at every Costco, at every Vaughn, Safeway. So why not, instead of just having carbonated beverages, why not sell these other things? Okay. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Avid now. I'm very, I'm very, very passionate about Avid. So Avid's a nonprofit. I, I, um, I'd done all this work, yay for me. And then I had retired after I had an accident. And then I thought, well, I'll just retire. And my wife said, you know, you're too young to retire. You've got to go get out of the house and do something. And we were living in, we, are, we do live in Carlsbad, which is an ocean community uh, north of San Diego. And I said, well, you know, I don't really want to jump on the corporate jet again. And I don't want to move to New York, where we used to live. Um, she said, well, just why don't you try to find something? So serendipity, God's hand of inter intervention, intervention, I don't know. But Avid um, is a San Diego-based nonprofit. Now that's kind of rare because it's a national nonprofit. Most pro nonprofits are headquartered either in Washington, D.C., New York City, or San Francisco. Well, this one actually was started by a teacher. It stands for Advancement Via Individual Determination. And what, this, what, what Avid does is it helps kids, generally they're the first ones in their family, to be ready and prepared to go to college. So I'm going to show you some data here. The first chart is kind of a condemnation of our public education system in the United States. So about 25% of all kids in the United States don't even finish high school. They just drop out, poof. They're not even graduates. Of the kids who graduate, okay, only about a third of them, of the kids who graduate from high school, only about a third of them have fulfilled the requirements so they're eligible for an admission to a four-year college. So I'm not talking Harvard, Princeton. I'm talking just whatever, uh, University of Hawaii, Manoa, uh, you know, BYU, Hawaii, a, a regular four-year college. Only about a third of the kids have done that. And if you go further, you say it's about 40% of the, of the Anglos, almost 50% of the Asians, and then it's 25% of the African Americans and 22% of the Latinos. And this is referred to as the achievement gap, okay? So either you believe that in fact, Asians have more skills and abilities than African Americans and whites have more than Latinos, or you think something else must be happening here. There must be something that someone's missing because we actually do believe that all children can achieve. And the federal government has poured billions of dollars to get rid of this achievement gap. The state governments have done it. I was the president of a school board for eight years in Carlsbad. The local school board does it, and yet this persists. It just persists and persists and persists. So that, this is the overall population of the United States. Now I'm going to tell you about the AVID population. Your typical AVID um, student is on free and reduced lunch. People know what free and reduced lunch is. That means you, you live in poverty. So 70% of the kids are on free and reduced lunch. 55% of them only have one parent in their house. 85% will be the first one in their family to go to college. They're about because we're very large in California and Texas and Florida, about 50% of our kids are Latino, about 25% are African American, the rest are a combination of Pacific Islander, Anglo, Asian. So the population I'm now going to show you is not as well off as the ones that are in gold. And the incredible thing about AVID is if the kids are in AVID for three years, 90 plus percent of all those kids are eligible, have met the requirements to be admitted to a four-year college. That is extraordinary. That is extraordinary to have the kids that we work with. And the great thing I think about Abbott is it works in, this is what I was telling you, the governor yesterday, Governor Abercrombie, is Abbott works in real schools. We were visiting a school yesterday, and it was an old, the average school in Hawaii is, was, is over 60 years old, the average school building. You don't have to build a brand new high school and wire it for internet. I mean, if you've done that, that's great. But Avid works in a regular school, right around the corner here. It works with real teachers. The teachers can be unionized, they can be non-unionized, they can be in their 40th year of teaching or in their fourth year of teaching, and it works with them, and it works with real kids. We don't cherry pick the kids and say, just give us the, just give us the smart ones. We do say, we want kids with individual determination. So we don't want you to shove them into to Avid. We don't want you to say, 
um, you're either going to go to juvenile detention or you're going to go to Abbott. We want the kids to, say, to raise their hand and say, I'm individually determined that I want to go to college. But to have that kind of results, 91 to 94 percent, is really extraordinary. We're very, very proud of that. And so you might say, well, gosh, you've talked about Pepsi and Pizza Hut, and how'd you get into Abbott? Well, what happened was Abbott was started by a teacher, Mary Catherine Swanson. She's still alive. I'm going to see her at our board meeting uh, two weeks from today. And she was in a school where the school was being integrated, and a lot of the white kids and their parents pulled their kids out of school. And then she had the kids of color, and she went to the principal and said, I think we ought to get these kids ready for high school. Uh, not for high school, excuse me, for college. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. They don't have those aspirations. Their families are different. On and on and on. And she said, well, why don't we try an experiment? Why don't you let me have them for four years, and I'll work with them. And if it's a great success, we'll give you, Mr. Principal, all the credit. If it's a huge failure, you can blame me. That sounded pretty good to him. <laughs> so she had the kids for four years in what became Avid. You know, I don't know what the, I don't know at the time I don't know what it was on their transcript. I don't know what it was called college prep or whatever. But she had those 30 kids for four years. At the end of four years, 28 of them were accepted at four-year universities, and two of them at, at uh, community colleges. And they, they had to go through a lot. There was one young lady who was in that original class, and she tells a story. Her father was an alcoholic. She had to write an honors term paper. This was before, this was 35 years ago, before word processing. Have any of you ever seen a picture of a typewriter? Okay, so she actually had to type this 10 page term paper on a typewriter. There was no memory. Her father came in and said, What is this? She said, Well, it's, it's an honors paper for this class I'm taking. And he said, Really? He said, Oh, you think you're better than the rest of us, don't you? He ripped it up and threw it on the ground. Well, she was devastated. She was devastated. She'd worked so hard. And she said, however, I felt like I couldn't let the other kids in the class down because all of us had said we were going to go to college. So I sat down and I did the best I could to try to recreate that paper. That woman now has two PhDs and teaches at the University of Michigan. You know, so you talk about great individual termination. There, there are other great stories I could tell you. So I was brought into Abbott about five years ago because they were growing so fast. They were just growing by leaps and bounds. And they said, we need someone who can help us price our product. We need a strategy that has all these attributes that you've talked about. So our strategy around Abbott is quality, growth, and culture. And to tell you a little bit about that, we do a lot of training. What Richard was telling you is we've been training Hawaiians educators for the last five years in Sacramento and San Diego. And it's expensive. It is expensive to fly those people over, uh, you know, over the Pacific Ocean. So we told the governor that if they would stick with us, we would bring the conference to them. So we're going to be back. We're going to be here in Honolulu June uh, 5th, 6th, and 7th. But um, the other thing that's expensive is putting people. So we trained about 22,000. In the toughest year economically that education's had, Abbott had a record year. We had more teachers trained. We had 22,000 teachers that came for our training. So one of the other things we did is we tried to think about the client. Okay, We took our five days of training. And we'd reduce that to three. And we charge the same tuition. So why'd we, how'd, how'd we make that happen? We made a big investment in blended learning. So now before the teachers get there, there's some exercises they do before they get there. And after we call those launches, right? So that you're launching your experience. Then they come and they have the face-to-face -face training. It's very intensive. And in the morning, you're with teachers of your same persuasion. You teach the Abbott elective, you teach science, you're a high school counselor, you're a principal. So in the morning you're with people that are doing the same thing you're doing and then in the afternoon you're with your site team from the Martin Luther King Memorial High School or whatever and you're saying how can we how can we take our kids who are getting you know these kind of results and how do we make it like that and it's extraordinarily successful. So we went from a five-day summer institute to a three-day summer institute. That saved our clients about a third. It saved them about uh, 30 percent, 33 percent if you're in California because we pay teachers more. So that saved them a lot of money. It also made it, but the idea wasn't just to save them money. We wanted to have higher quality. We wanted to have better consistency. So it didn't just depend on you having the great lecture or the awful lecture. We wanted to have the great one every time. And then after they're done, we give them boost. So for the next eight months after Summer Institute's over, they can go back and refresh themselves with um, some interact, and before they present it to a group of 30 kids, they can go back and do it um, 
you know, uh, in a simulation. So that's kind of what we've done there. Okay. Well, what I'm trying to help you understand is what lots of times people do when they do a strategy is they say, okay, here's how we do things. And it's analogous to a winding road. Have, have any of you ever lived on the East Coast? I don't know if anyone's ever lived there. Okay. In almost every town in the East Coast, there's, a, there's something called Post Road. And it's the, it's the road that the postman used to follow, and it's windy and it curves around. Uh, the worst places for pizza delivery in the United States are New England, because the roads are dark and narrow and they curve around. The best delivery town in America is Phoenix, Arizona. Have any of you ever seen Phoenix from an airplane? It's perfectly symmetrical, right? But what a lot of times people do when they're redoing processes, they just pave over the old winding road or they do the exact same processes and they do them just a little bit different. What you really want to do is you want to build a new road. You know, you want to build a new road that has the breadth and the depth that you can, you can speed down. If you've been in the Autobahn in Germany, you can go pretty fast, but you want it to be straight. So I'd, one thing to think about, whatever your chosen career is going to be or whatever your entrepreneurial thing, think about not paving over the old winding road, but building a new road. This is something that we've used a lot in every organization I've been at. It's called the planning wheel. Because sometimes people think, okay, we'll make our plan and it'll go from A to Z. Uh, kind of the way I thought I could plan my career, remember I was telling you about that? But that really doesn't happen that way. It's more of a continuous process. So what we do is we start out and we evaluate what's the current situation. I've given you a couple examples of that. Gave you the pizza situation, right? What was the current situation that we had? We had great dining restaurants. Unfortunately, America was going a different direction and they wanted convenience. They wanted the pizza brought to them. They wanted to carry it out. We had great Pepsi-Cola commercials, but unfortunately people didn't want sugar water as much as they wanted water that had other attributes to it. So you evaluate the current situation. You try to establish your strategic imperatives. These are things you're going to do. Come hell or high water, you're going to do it over a number of years, and you're going to put the resources against it. Then that says, okay, we've evaluated that. These are our strategic imperatives. Let's design a plan around those performance elements. So at, at Avid, our strategic imperatives originally had to do with quality, growth, and culture. We wanted our quality to be consistent whether you were experiencing Avid in Atlanta, right, or over here in Hawaii. So that was a very, very important thing to us. We wanted to continue to grow. We wanted to, our goal is to have, is to reform public education in the United States. There's about 700,000 kids that are experiencing Avid. We want 35 million kids to experience the benefits of it. And we want to do it with a culture that's attractive to folks, that people want to come and work for us as a nonprofit. So you design these, and then you come back and you say, let's execute against our plan. <coughs> In the meantime, either your capabilities as an organization have changed, you've given people better tools and better way of doing things, so that's great, or it didn't work out as well as you thought, or the marketplace has changed, the current situation is different. One of the things that we're noticing in AVID now is we have three new strategic imperatives. This is what we're going to be working on for the next five years. And one of them is instead of just helping the 30 kids who are in the AVID classroom, so a high school will have 30 kids three times, you'll help 90 kids, we want to spread across the campus whether you're in the AVID classroom or not. So that's one of our imperatives is to um, accelerate school-wide AVID. Okay? Another one is there's more and more kids like you who are used to doing things online. So rather than us just training teachers or educators, we want things that go right to the student. that don't necessarily have a teacher there to get in the way, particularly as they get older and as they're making that transition from high school to college. It's pretty tough. Even once you get admitted to college, it's pretty tough when you first get in there. And then our third one is to be more successful in large urban districts. About 3% of the school districts in America have 18% of the kids, and those are usually the districts that have the most problems. So those are our strategic imperatives that we're kind of going after. So I'm gonna, in closing, I'm going to try to give some advice of things I've learned. So I told you at the outset that I learned, first of all, your career is unlikely to be linear. It's probably going to go up and down and go different ways that you never expected. I never thought I'd be selling soda or pizza or working for a nonprofit educator or elevators. I, I mean, I had no idea. I don't, and you know, if we were going to get together 15 or 20 years from now, I bet what you think your careers are going to be like will be quite different. So that's one thing I've already shared with you. The other one is, and I, I, learned, I learned all of these principles from someone else, so I don't want to take credit as if I made these up. But I remember one person that I worked with said, you know, Mark, most people are either at cause or they're at effect. 
I said, what do you mean? He said, well, people that are at cause say, yes, life is tough, right? Sometimes things don't work out the way you want to, but that's okay. I'm going to make, I'm going to make a difference. I'm, I'm going to figure out how to make a difference. Others say, the world's against me. If only my boss had been nicer, right? If only, fill in the blank, this had been better, I would have got promoted. I would have had all these great things. <laughs> Richard and I can tell you about a guy that used to be in our ward growing up. Uh, he was a really interesting guy, but he was absolutely certain that he invented the yo-yo. He invented everything, I think. <laughs> yeah, but um, he was very, he was definitely at effect. The world was against him, and if only you know things had gone different. So most people are either in one camp or the other. You want to be at cause. You want to say it doesn't matter what the roadblocks are. It doesn't matter what happens. I'm going to make a difference. You know, the difference between successful people and unsuccessful people is successful people do the hard thing. My, uh, my sister-in-law, who used to be the young women's president, Susan Tanner, she's now on a mission with my other brother in Brazil. Um, she tried to teach all of her kids, and we, we stole it from hers. You teach your kids to say to themselves, I can do hard things. So, you know, there's a flood, or there's a hurricane, and I'm not trying to be like-minded about it. Somebody in the family gets cancer, you know, hard things happen, there's an accident. Those things are going to happen. You say, I can, it's okay, I can do hard things. I know how to accomplish hard things. People that are successful do the hard thing. People that aren't successful usually don't pay that price. So that's something you ought to think about. When I hire people, I give them this little mantra. I said, you know, there's three things, there's three things you need to do to be successful in this organization. This was true at Pepsi, it was true at Pizza Hut, it's true at Mrs. Fields, is that you need to add value, be timely and be accurate. I said, it's like a three-legged stool. If one of the legs is missing, it doesn't work. So say, um, say you give a really great analysis. It's really accurate and it's so insightful. It's terrific. But I actually needed it two days ago because that's when I was having my meeting with the board of directors and I needed to make a recommendation. So if you're late with all that great stuff, ah, it doesn't work. Or if you you're, um, you add value, and you're on time, but you're inaccurate. Well, that's kind of not very good either, right? You had great insights, it was on time, but you had mistaken assumptions, or you hadn't really thought it through. Well, then your stool comes crashing down. And probably the worst one is you're on time and you're accurate, but you add no value. Well, I could have hired an eighth grader to do that, right? So yes, you got it to me on time, it was accurate, but you didn't think anything. There's nothing that, going from you to me, there was no value added. Well, that doesn't do much good either. So if you can do those three things, you're very likely to be successful. Um, now, this is something that we had in my family, in our refrigerator, was we had three things. We had life is good, let it go, and then the third one was choose to be happy. Life really is quite good. I mean, we, sometimes you can get very discouraged. You, might, you may want to stop listening to the news, but when you think about how we live versus how the very, very wealthy used to live, they didn't have, you know, you couldn't get in a shower and turn it on and it was hot water that came out. You didn't get clean water coming out of the tap. Even if you have an old beaten down car, I guarantee you the shocks in that are better than the shocks were in Louis XIV's carriage that bumped up and down. You know, most of us are warm and dry at night. So li life's pretty good. You're being educated here. Everybody has something they need to let go of. We all sort of harbor our own little resentments, our own little thing. And sometimes you just got to let go of that. And then you got to choose to be happy. Richard and I both grew up with a dad, and that was a big deal was, you know, it's not so much, it's not so important what happens to you, it's how you feel about it. And I'm sure you've seen that in your life. You might have, a fr you might have two friends, the exact same thing happens to them, right? And one is question, can't, can't get out of bed, and the other one says, okay, I'm going to move on. So. I think that was my last slide. Yes, that's me. <laughs> um, Richard said to take a couple of minutes for questions or follow up, which I'm happy to do at this time. Yes, sir. With all the opportunities that you had in front of you, how did you choose to um, do what you did do? So I'm supposed to repeat the question for the recording. So the question was, for with all the opportunities, how did I choose which one I wanted to do? At the time, I don't know that I felt like I had this super duper plethora of choices. You know, at the time, I remember I was living in South America working for a banana company in a banana republic, so I was really, really isolated. And the opportunity for United Technologies came along. I didn't know that I would join them and 
six years later be promoted as the youngest executive in the history. I think part of that was you don't always know the end from the beginning, so you kind of have to, you know, I can think I can tell this audience, you ought to pray about it. Sometimes I don't think God really cares. You know, the fact that I went with United Technologies versus, I don't know, Ford Motor Company, I don't know if God really cared about that as much as am I being a good person, am I being a good father and a good husband. But, um, but I will answer your question. When you're looking, if you have multiple opportunities, rather than think just about how much is it going to pay you, or um, what's the job title? I think you ought to think about, can I learn something from the people I'm going to be with? Right? If you are definitely the smartest person in that organization and you're the most capable one, even if you have a great job title, they pay you a couple thousand dollars more, it may not be as good as the one that's going to stretch you a little bit. So that's what I think, yeah. Being the fact that you had all these responsibilities, you're really busy. Well, how did you manage that in your family life? Okay, so the question was, how do you manage your family life with being real busy? I, uh, well, marry the right person. That's very good. That's a good thing to do. Um, I have five children, and what I tried to do is, I don't think in my entire career I ever brought work home where I actually worked at it at night. So when I would be driving home, I tried to have like a little there'd be a certain stop sign or a bush that I'd see. And that was my reminder. I said, okay, when I get to that bush, it's to remind me my family gets my best because my employers had my best all day. And I really have tried very, very hard. So from now on out, my family gets my best. I would always tell my employer, in fact, I was just telling somebody this a week ago. She wanted me to do some consulting for her. I said, you need to understand that I'm very, very orthodox on a religious standpoint. Sundays, I don't recreate. I didn't watch the Super Bowl. <laughs> You know, Sundays is when I'm going to be doing church stuff, so usually on Saturdays, unless it's a big emergency, I'm not going to plan on doing a lot of your work on Saturdays. Occasionally, you know, if the, if the building's burning down or something, I'll, I'll do that. But I tried to be consistent that way, and I think the Lord also blessed me and sort of magnified my, my strengths, because, um, you know, I married a good person. Um, we probably moved more times than she would have liked because she's a little bit shy and so uh, in corporate America we got transferred quite a bit but I did try to when I got home I tried to make the family the focus when I got home on Saturdays with my five kids each one of them knew that every fifth Saturday was their special I would go out to breakfast with them by themselves so those come you know I don't know that I have any magic formula but that that was helpful to me other questions yes sir so you've moved quite a few times between really substantial career choices. What is it that made you think, okay, my time at this company is finished and this other company looks great? Like, like a great opportunity. <laughs> you guys ask great questions. So uh, to re I'm supposed to repeat these back. So how did you know that it was time to move on when you're doing well at, a, at another company? <laughs> well, typically, it would, be, it would be for more responsibility. So I don't know that I ever made a lateral move. Um, you know, when I, when I went out to Detroit, and Richard and Sean know this, it, that wasn't the happiest experience. I went out to Detroit, I was very, very young. I was a CFO of a billion dollar company. And so that was very attractive to me, to go out and, and our bonds were traded on the American exchange. But what I found out after I got there was the company had way too much debt and we probably weren't gonna be able to make our payroll. So I made that decision, I went there and I did the best I could and we did it for about two years. But part of me regretted it because I was so comfortable in the cushy corporate office in Hartford and here I was in the trenches and we really, we really didn't know if we'd have enough money to make the payroll every two weeks. It was, it was not a good thing. I grew a lot, I got a lot of experience. But then the interesting thing was when, when my resume was presented to Pizza Hut, they had already paid a recruiter there, there's certain kinds of recruiters. They had paid a recruiter who was, on, who was getting paid whether he found somebody or not. And the CFO said, I want to hire Mr. Tanner. And they said, no, you can't hire him because then we're going to have to pay two recruiters. So the fact that I had gone at a very young age to Detroit to be the CFO of that company, and then it was kind of a disaster. I found out that, you know, it wasn't until I was really there that I found out they didn't have enough money. But still, that leveraged me then later on um, to get a great position with, with PepsiCo. 
Stan to be their number two finance person at Pizza Hut and in charge of their strategy. So I don't know that there's a formula. I, you know, the, the, when I think about these questions that you're, you folks are asking, I don't know that there's really a formula. I think you kind of have to. I think you kind of have to weigh things out and say, does this seem like a good next step? And I, I really think that's a lot of what faith is, quite frankly. I don't think God usually lays out for you and says, here it is. Here's how you're going to go from February 14th, 2013 to the day you die, and, and I, I'm going to tell you everything. But I think he will tell you that's a good next step. That's, that's an acceptable next step. So. Yes? What did you go to school for? Why did I go to school? What did you study at school? Oh, I studied uh, economics at Stanford, and then I got an MBA in finance and accounting from UCLA. Okay, thank you. Thank you.